most fully foreshadow the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In a Passover scene, he raises the widow's son from the dead. And finally, Elijah is caught up into heaven by a whirlwind to enter into his eternal home. I can relate more, but as I've already mentioned, we don't have the luxury of eternity as did Moses and Elijah. And as we discovered, neither did Jesus. But Peter, James, and John certainly wanted that luxury. They wanted to stay. I wonder how long they stayed on that holy mountain. No doubt Peter, James, and John were in trance, desiring to be there. They were overawed by the scenes of glory when they should have been listening to the very words of the prophets on the necessity of our own exodus journeys involving suffering and death for the sake of the kingdom. Before any glory, we're all charged with the task of following Jesus. And what does he say before he goes up onto the Mount of Transfiguration? He gives a lesson. And the lesson is this. He says, Come, follow me. Take up your cross and follow me, Jesus said. But Peter, Peter was entranced with glory. Peter wanted to set up tabernacles for them to live in, even have one for Jesus. Now that's the Eastern mindset, isn't it? I love those from the Middle East and other lands where time is seemingly so inconsequential. Even today you might have a wedding that lasts like three days. Worship service is scarcely less than three hours. Talk to someone who is an Eastern Orthodox Christian and they'll tell you about that. Visit someone in a home steeped in such a culture and you'll discover that there's an expectation of a meal and drink and conversation way late into the wee hours of the night of morning. It doesn't matter whether or not you have to work at 8 o'clock the next day. There's something beautiful about it, yet still annoying for those who worship scheduling. Ah, they're admirable guys, these Peter, James, and John. They wanted to stay. Heaven was touching the earth that day, and they wanted to the sense of eternity forever. But of course, it could not last. Perhaps unexpectedly, it was the Eternal Father, the creator of human time, who knew of his son's mission in time that must now move forward. From the cloud he calls, and he says, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Moses and Elijah disappear behind the veil. They're in heaven, conversing. Then there is only Jesus, and he was beckoning them downward, downward towards his mission. But it would ultimately become their mission also, the mission of the disciples and our mission as the church. Remember what he said just prior to the mountaintop experience. Take up your cross and follow me. There is one fashion just for you. Maybe it's to take up the cause of the unborn and tell the world that these little ones are human beings worthy of life. Oh, that's a heavy cross. Simply utter that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Such exclusivity, definitely not the Canadian way. What a cross. Pray in the inner sanctum of your home, unseen, and look out praise for your congregation, for your leaders, for the church as a whole. That's a cross, too. Put worship time on a high priority and instruct others to do so. Sacrificing invitations to parties or conferences or to that date of an extra hour of sleep. A small little cross. But there's a cross just for you. Oh, you crazy man, I know that you may be thinking such things. A cross really suffering? 
I'm sorry to break it to you, for vast numbers of televangelists want to give you a prosperity gospel. They want to give you some name-it-and-claim-it theology. They want your worship experience to be much like a theater and as much like recreation as possible. They want you to think how happy you'll be in the Christian life nonstop. But what Jesus has in store for you and I is something deeper than that. Something grander than mere happiness, happiness and happenings in our life. It is deeper and more meaningful than a life lived in superficiality. For he has a life of fulfillment and purpose for us. One of struggle and battle, and ultimately victory in him. I like how Luke describes our Lord's exodus. What does he say? It is an exodus that he accomplishes in Jerusalem. For we who follow, we share with him that sense of accomplishment. We hope to hear similar words from the Father at our life's end, and just as the Father said, This is my Son, with whom I am well pleased, we who follow in faith in the strength of the Lord may hear, Well done, good and faithful servant. Who doesn't want the approval of a Father? And here we are promised the approval of the most important Father in our lives, the Eternal Father. That's a life that is worth something. That's a life that we strive for, not just a life of pleasure. But remember what is to come after suffering. It was the resurrection. It is the glory. Jesus rose from the dead. They could scarcely recognize him, for he glowed in glory. Such is our calling to do not despair or become disheartened when suffering and carrying your cross happens. We take up our cross with Jesus that we may follow him into death, that we may also follow him into the resurrection and ascend with him into eternal glory in heaven. Did you know that each one of us already gives off a kind of glow? I, I was learning about this. The infrared cameras can spot it just like maybe in a James Bond movie. And I suppose it's kind of be, to be expected. For we're made in the image of God. But when that image is fully restored in Christ, then wow, it's not something that just needs to be seen by an infrared camera. It's something that you cannot miss. So that it will be, as the prophet Daniel said, we shall shine like stars forever and ever. May this be true in our lives on this day.